All right, okay. All of you are back, amazing. All right, you had coffee? Yeah, you go tea maybe? Okay, so here's that deep lens thing, right? Hopefully it's more than a paperweight, we'll see. Right, we see that, we'll see that later on today. Okay, so um, the first session was a, a pretty hectic uh, race through a whole lot of services. Okay, just to give you the big picture. And now we're going to start diving deeper. Uh, and we're going to focus in this session on deep learning, the technology, what you can do with it from a developer point of view. We're going to start looking at notebooks, train some models, learn some stuff, okay? And uh, in the next session, you'll focus uh, with uh, Ian on uh, chatbots, okay, which are another uh, uh, massive application of deep learning, okay? So what are we going to cover here? So we're going to say a quick word about AI in general. I, you know, I want to dispel a few myths and, and just you know, make sure we're on the same page. Uh, I'm going to talk quickly about infrastructure. Uh, we saw in the previous talk that, yes, we do need uh, infrastructure to train and, and use machine learning models. And uh, well, maybe there are a few things to be, to be uh, studied here, OK? Then we're going to spend most of our time looking at actual neural networks, uh, some common architectures, and, and use cases. And I will highlight those uh, using a bunch of GitHub projects that I think are pretty amazing. Then we'll really quickly uh, go through an introduction to MXNet. I'll just introduce, introduce you to the very basics, uh, the basic objects that you need to understand to be able to read and write those 50 lines of Pythons, of Python that I promise really everyone in this room can <laughs> understand. And then, of course, we're going to jump into demos, notebooks, uh, train models, uh, and, uh, and use Jupyter Notebooks. Okay, and although obviously I will host these notebooks in SageMaker, um, you could literally run all this stuff on your own laptop. Um, all the code will be available on GitHub. Okay, so this is really not a SageMaker talk. But this, this will be a later talk, okay? And yeah, I'll share some resources, okay? So, um, well, this has been my crusade for a while. Um, a lot of people would like to believe, would like you to believe that AI is dark magic, right? You wave your hands at data, you write some cryptic equations on a whiteboard, uh, probably throw some chicken blood and, and some other additional stuff for good measure, right? And voila, as we say, right? And you have a model. And oh, it's very, very complicated. <coughs> and uh, what they really mean by that is, well, I know about this and you don't because probably you're not smart enough. So why don't you pay me a whole lot of money to get the job done for you, and I'll give you a model and trust me it works, okay? And well, I have a strong dislike for this kind of attitude in general, <laughs> even more so when it comes to AI. And as you know, this is not what AWS stands for, okay? AWS wants to empower you to build stuff, okay? We build Lego blocks, right? You build platforms with them. Right? And in some cases, you build your own blocks and you add them to the, to the mix. So none of that elite ivory tower thing, well, as far as I'm concerned. We don't want that. So when you look at it, right, when you uh, blow on the smoke and, uh, and you ignore the buzzwords and the magazine covers, AI is about three things. Okay? It, it is a bit of math, yes. Let's not hide that fact. Okay? Uh, even though um, using high-level libraries like MXNet, TensorFlow, <laughs> et cetera, you can literally do away with the math, okay? But if you want to understand how the technology works in detail, if you want to build your own APIs, et cetera, sure, a bit of algebra and a bit of uh, 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 computer science is not going to hurt, okay? But generally, <coughs> and for what we're going to do today, we're going to ignore that stuff, okay? So it's actually engineering, right? So it's code. You write code, you, writing a model means writing code. You can see some uh, MXNet uh, Python code here, and this is enough to define a convolutional neural network, right? Those 10 or 12 lines of code, that's all it takes. So it's code, usually it's Python, okay? That's uh, our preferred language for a lot, of, uh, a lot of that jobs, a lot of those jobs. So it's easy, right? And you all can do code, right? 
If you've done uh, legacy Java apps, right? Trust me, you can do this, okay? If you, if you, uh, if you spend your life fixing, uh, you know, Java code from the early 2000s, right? <coughs> this, is, this is a walk in the park. Uh, and we need some chips, right? Uh, to run and train our models, okay? And we need GPUs and we need CPUs, all right? From our good friends at Intel and NVIDIA, all right? So actually, let's start with this because I want to make sure, you know, you understand when to use CPUs and when to use GPUs. This will have, you know, a nice impact on performance, but it will also have an important impact on cost, and it's important too. So, like I said earlier, we introduced this new family of P3 instances uh, in October, and uh, you can grab uh, those P3 instances in three different sizes, from one to eight GPUs. They're uh, insanely powerful, insanely powerful. They have crazy, uh, crazy numbers. And they're the fastest chip you can get for uh, training. Okay, when you, want, when you want to train large deep learning models on large data sets, millions of images, and so on, these are a good choice, okay? But there is another option. The other option is to use CPU instances. And about a few months ago as well, we introduced a new <coughs> CPU-based family called C5. And if you're familiar with AWS, you know the C family is for the compute-oriented jobs. So these instances tend to get the latest Intel chips, uh, the more powerful ones with you know, custom, uh, custom features uh, from Intel to speed up uh, compute, and in this case, machine learning. So this, this, the cool thing about C5 is that it introduces the Skylake architecture, which is the latest uh, Intel architecture. And so it's generally faster, you know, more cores, more of everything. But it, it also brings a new dedicated instruction set called AVX, uh, which, uh, which are vector instructions that let you run the same code in parallel on multiple data. Uh, uh, it's called SIMD, single instruction multiple data architecture. Okay? And so these are super useful when you want to do math or scientific computing in general, and they can be put to good use when we're going to train and, and predict with machine learning models. Okay, so this is not just, oh, okay, it's a faster CPU. It's also a CPU that comes with specific instructions that are going to help. Okay, so let's talk about cost for a second. Okay, as you can see, uh, here are the prices for uh, the, the C5 and the P2 and P3 instances. Okay, and okay, P3 is awesome, right? P3 16XL, it's, it's like a, a supercomputer <laughs> in a server, but on demand price, Sits at twenty-six dollars per hour. Okay, so now you know. Now you see why. You know, before you click on that blue it button that says "Launch Instance" and yes, give me ten of those. Um, <laughs> you know, you might. It might be worth your time. You know, just to say, yeah, is that really smart? Okay. Uh, if you look at the largest C5, which has seventy-two cores, a whole <laughs> lot of uh, memory, etc., it's three point four dollars per hour. Okay, so obviously, I'm, you know, the GPU instance will still be much more powerful than that C5. But as we can see, at on-demand price, we could have, let's say, eight or nine of those C5s for the same price as the P316XL. Okay, so now, from an, I would say, a high availability point of view, from a load balancing point of view, uh, we have to consider whether one is better than the other. Okay, because it's, especially when you do Prediction, right? Prediction is usually come in the form of, F of HTTP requests. So if you need to handle 10,000 HTTP requests for prediction per second, maybe it's a better idea to run them on eight or nine C5s than a single P3, right? It's not just about the GPU. It's about scaling the rest as well. The web server that's going to handle those 10K requests per second, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So you have to look at the big picture here. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm guessing you're all familiar with spot instances, right? The ability to buy unused EC2 capacity at deeply discounted prices. Now, there is a massive difference here. Uh, the P3s are brand new, or relatively new. And as of today, it's, it is pretty difficult to grab P3 instances on the spot market, as you can see, right? 
So if you're lucky, you might. But it is pretty difficult. P2s are easier, but P3s, there's so much demand for them that it's unlikely you'll get a good deal on the spot market at the moment. Okay? We'll add more capacity and make sure this problem is solved, but that's a reality. On the other, on the other end, you know, we, there are plenty of C5s and C4s, even more so. Okay? So it's very easy to grab the CPU instances on the spot market at super low prices. Okay? Uh, here, as you can see, we can grab that C5 at about $1.4 instead of that 3.4 on demand price. So it's more than, uh, way more than 50% discount. Okay? So when you look at this one, you could say, well, now, based on this situation, and again, it might be a temporary situation, but it, it's pretty realistic for now. For the same amount of money, I can have about 20, 20, more, 20 times more uh, C5 instances than I can have P3 instances. So now you have to balance things, right? Now you have to test. You have to try and test your, train your model on one P3, train it on 20 C5, see what it does, right? And there are no built-in answers to this. You have to try it. It might be faster, it might be much lower, it might be, you know, you have to try it, you have to experiment, okay? So that's for training. Now, for prediction, to me, it's pretty obvious we should use C5. Okay? Because we're going to be able to, to spread those instances across multiple availability zones. We're going to be able to load balance a, a, a huge amount of traffic on those instances. And most of the time, we're going to do single image prediction anyway, right? When, imagine you have a mobile app and people take pictures and, and they want to have prediction on this. You predict one image at a time. And when you do this, actually, GPUs, they don't have such a performance advantage. When you need high throughput, if you need to predict 30, 60 images in one go, yes, they, are, they have an edge, definitely, because they can put their thousands of cores to good use. But when you predict one image at a time, the, the, the absolute performance that you get on a GPU is not that much greater than it would be on a CPU instance. So as a rule of thumb, I would say, um, if you have very large data sets, right, millions of images, hundreds of hours of video or text, etc., GPUs are the way to go, okay? If you have smaller data sets, then it's really worth trying on CPU instances, even for training, okay? It will be slower than on GPUs, but the time cost ratio might still be very attractive to you, okay? And unless you need to predict large, bunch, large bunches of images at the same time, I believe CPU instances win all the time. Okay? But run your own tests and, and come, come up with your own conclusions. Okay? So I love those CPUs. I love those GPUs. I hate spending money, right? Even if I don't pay my AWS bills. And some evil people say this is the only reason why I joined them, actually. <laughs> right? Maybe that's true, who knows? But you are paying your bills, and we don't want you to save, we don't want you to spend your money uh, unnecessarily. We want you to save money, right? I mean, every year we give back hundreds of millions of dollars to customers by going to them, uh, uh, visiting them, and saying, You're spending too much, uh, you need to optimize your platform. And I'm sure some people in the room have had this experience with a solution architect. Yeah, they knock on your door and say, this is not optimal. You need, here's what you should do, and, and you cut your EC2 bill by 50%. Okay? And if it never happened to you, call your SA and ask them to do that job for you. Right? They will. It's part of their responsibility. OK, let's move on to networks. So we're going to look at some of those networks, what you can do with them, and then we're going to run the demos. Okay? So um, let's start with this, uh, which is probably the king of uh, neural networks at the moment. It's called the Convolutional Neural Network, CNN in short. Uh, these go back uh, quite a while now. Uh, and they were uh, invented by uh, a researcher called Yann Lequin, a French guy, so yeah. Uh, <laughs> see, we're not that useless after all. Uh, and uh, now he's heading the, uh, the Facebook AI lab in, uh, in Paris and uh, is one of the deep learning and AI uh, Experts, world experts. So 
um, he started to come up with this new architecture that uh, would be efficient at recognizing images. And this was actually one of the first industrial applications of neural networks, uh, re uh, recognizing, uh, performing automatic, uh, automatic image recognition on checks, right? So banks were happy to give uh, uh, people a lot of money to build systems that could automatically read checks, right? So that's, uh, that, that, that's actually how long it took to build industrial applications with neural networks. Remember, these go back to the 50s, right? And, um, well, th this type of architecture um, is, um, is, is pretty clever, and this is a, a, a proper network. It's called LeNet. That was invented by uh, Jan Leca. And um, the way those networks operate is by taking, obviously, an input picture and shrinking it over multiple steps through operations called convolution and pooling, and those are math operations, right, that shrink the dimension of pictures, but extracting, uh, keeping important features. And as you probably know, this is the magic of neural networks, the ability to detect, to learn automatically what's important in your data set and what's not, right? Compared to traditional machine learning, when you need to do feature engineering, you need to tell the algo what the features are, and then the algo learns how to predict from these features the correct output, right? So there's a lot of manual work to do before you can even learn. With deep learning, you can just throw images, in this case, at the network and say, hey, here's the image, here's what it should be, right? So this is a 60 uh, kilometers per hour sign, okay? So I'm giving you an image, I'm giving you a label, and actually I will, I will give you a whole bunch of images and labels. So you learn from that stuff, and, and you figure out what's important in there, okay? And this is, at, again, at the core of this, you have the, this convolution operation that is gonna extract the important features. And as you can see, as we go deeper into the network, we shrink the image from 32, 32, to 28, 28, to 14, 15, all the way down to five by five, right, which is a, much smaller, right? You start with 32 by 32, which is over 900 features, right? If you want to see each pixel as a feature, you can. And we take it down to literally 25 features, right? So we shrink it and shrink it and shrink it, but the convolution and pooling shrink in a way that those tiny pictures that you get at the end and that look nothing like the initial picture, they still convey the important information about the picture. And then we can run a plain classifier on this and learn from this data set, okay? Um, you don't have to understand convolution and pooling in detail to use those networks, right? Uh, if, you, if you're curious how this really works, and I, I'm, I'm guessing you are, um, this is a really, really great blog post on the NVIDIA blog that actually takes you through those steps and explain why this really works, right? So it's not magic, like I said. There's no hand-waving, no... Uh, evil spells, it's just this and, and a few more operations that let us shrink data sets and then classify, okay? So what can you do with it? Here's a customer example. Expedia, uh, everybody knows Expedia, I think, travel company, and the problem that they have is they want to display the best uh, pictures on hotel pages. Best here, here meaning... Um, the ones that are likely to trigger a conversion, right? So some images are really good, right? And you have to keep in mind, some of these images are provided by hotels, and uh, actually a lot, I, I'm supposing most of the images come from customers, right? So <laughs> all of us can take pictures and upload them to the page. So, well, obviously some of us take that kind of picture, right? So, so I think everybody will be happy to know you can actually uh, enjoy your own private uh, restrooms, right? Uh, I'm not sure that's what I want to see on the page. And when it comes to the nuclear reactor, well, unless you're a nuclear scientist, um, this is probably not too appealing, right? So one way could be, oh, let's take those 10 million images, label them, right? Put a quality score, et cetera, and, and train a model from scratch, okay? Who wants to hand label 10 million images? How, do you, how much time do you think that takes, right? Think. 20 seconds per image, I mean, right, imagine the amount of time, right? So they didn't do that, because they're clever. 
they did that on 1% of the data set, right? 100K images. And actually, they hired people to do that. It cost them a few, a few thousand dollars, so very small amount of money. And then using an open source library called Keras and GPU instances, they fine-tuned the model. They, they retrained the model a little bit uh, just on the 100K images. Okay? And now automatically, they can find high-quality images from their collection and display them on the hotel pages. Right? If you're curious about the details, um, this URL has a, a video from one of the developers speaking at a, a Python conference and going through the project. And it's a surprisingly, it's a simple and short project, okay? but very impactful for the business. You can go beyond that, uh, do what we call object detection, which is one step further. It's like locating what's in the image and where. Okay? Uh, these are also called single shot detectors. And there are different ways, different architectures doing this. And actually, the two GitHub projects mentioned here are uh, MXNet implementations of state-of-the-art uh, SSDs. Okay? So uh, one of them is called uh, RCNN. Uh, and, uh, and the other one is called YOLO, which stands for you only look once, right? which is a good name for a single shot detector. So you can go to GitHub, grab the models. Um, they, they have pre-trained versions available. You can, you can just load them up with a couple of lines of Python and start using them. Okay? And you can read the research article, and you can uh, retrain those networks if you want on your own data, et cetera. But that would <coughs> save you a massive amount of time compared to trying to build everything from scratch. Um, you could be interested in segmentation, which is um, detection plus finding the exact outlines. And again, um, you can find on GitHub a project, an MXNet project, implementing mask RCNN, which is really state of the art for these kind of problems. And interestingly, um, this was released by a company called Too Simple. Uh, Too Simple is an AWS customer. Uh, they're a Chinese company building autonomous driving systems. So you can understand why it matters to them where. Uh, the old lady exactly is and where the pedestrian actually is, right? It's not just detection. I mean, a few inches make the difference between uh, being on time for your appointment and spending 10 years in jail. So <laughs> performance is important here. Um, last summer, uh, using uh, a model trained on MXNet, uh, as well as additional tools, they drove the truck, or the truck drove itself uh, automatically for uh, 200 miles across the southwest US. Okay, so this is almost a year old now, so imagine where they are now, right? So lots of stuff happening there. Uh, we, we talked about recognition in the earlier talk. Uh, imagine you want to build your own version. You want additional attributes. You want your own data, et cetera. Uh, you could do that uh, with the face detection. And again, a GitHub project called MXNet Face. Um, that does pretty much what recognition does, right? So uh, provided that you have enough data, to train, uh, you can do the same thing. You know, face detection plus uh, all kinds of attributes. It's fair to say, you know, there are more attributes here than uh, uh, than are available on recognition. So that might be interesting. Um, we we talked about Marinus Analytics in the previous talk, uh, and I think I mentioned Thorn, uh, that uh, uh, nonprofit org. So Thorn uh, has the same goal: try to identify missing kids uh, on. Uh, uh, on the internet and just basically try to find where they are and, and uh, have uh, law enforcement uh, rescue them. Uh, and, uh, and this is what the gentleman was asking for, you know, aging. Um, so using a, a partner called MemSQL, they can do aging. So if the kid disappeared five years ago, age 10, okay, now he or she would be 15. So of course, you, know, uh, you need to have uh, an up-to-date picture and, uh, and that's what uh, MemSQL does. Okay? They're going to edge the pictures, hand them over to Thorn, and then they can go and try to find those kids again. Right? Um, and that's serious stuff. And I, like I said, there is some silly stuff as well. Uh, this is a, an example, but I have to say this is a pretty cool project. It's called Real-Time Pose Estimation. Uh, so you take a video stream, you run it through um, um, a deep learning model, and uh, you're able to find the position of the human body, right? Shoulders, knees, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And this is all in real time. 
Uh, there's, no, uh, there's no tracking. It's really detection uh, frame by frame. Again, you can find this on GitHub. Um, I saw just, I think, yesterday, there's a new one from, uh, it's from Facebook. Uh, it's called Dense Pose. Anybody has seen that one? Yeah, yeah. The, the video was, was all over Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, look for that one, Dense Pose. It's pretty much the same thing, right? It's pose estimation, except now they do, uh, they, they have a wireframe over the body, right? So they know not just the shoulders and the knees, et cetera. They have a, a wireframe over the whole body, so they know exactly what, where each part is. And of course, they can do uh, text, they can apply textures in real time, right? So uh, this is crazy. The, the video is fantastic. I, I suggest you look at that one. Uh, and I'm waiting for someone to implement that. Um, they haven't released code yet. It's literally uh, 48 hours new, right? Dense pose, very cool. So of course, image and video processing are a popular use case for um, deep learning, but that's not it. That's not the only thing. Um, another network architecture uh, is called LSTM. And that's a crazy name because it's long and short, right? So it took me a while to figure that out. Um, we'll get to that. So these neurons, that's an LSTM neuron right there. Don't worry, I'm not going to go through the details. The, this, this is different from a traditional neuron in the sense that it keeps some information about the previous state, right? So uh, CNN neurons have no memory, OK? You show one image that they predict, and then you show something else, and they predict again. It's completely stateless. It's completely, you know, uh, all predictions are independent from one another. But in some use cases, like machine translation, for example, it's important to know about the previous state, right? Because if you know what the previous word was when you started translating a sentence, then you might be able to pick a better word for the <coughs> next translation. Okay, so the sequence of things, the sequence of predictions is actually important. So this is what LSTM achieve. They predict based on the current input, right, could be a word for translation, and from previous states, okay? And so now the name starts to make sense because they have short-term memory, right? So they're not gonna, they, they shouldn't remember the 50 or 100 words that came before, right? Because that could be a completely different sentence, and of course, it, it's not helpful. So they just need to remember a few more, a few predictions in the past, right? Short-term memory. And they're long, because you tend to chain those cells, right, uh, to build, to be able to predict long sequences, okay? If you want to predict sentences, if you want to, let's say, translate sentences of 100 words, that's a very long sentence, let's say, 20 words, well, you, you will need to chain those LSTM blocks to account for an input that is 20 word long. Okay, so that's why they're called LSTM, because you chain them to predict sequences and they have short term memory. Okay, so uh, the Sockai project that I mentioned earlier, the open source project by AWS, you can find it on GitHub, it is based on this LSTM architecture. Okay, and there's a really nice tutorial uh, with data sets to train a machine learning model to translate uh, German to English, or you could do it the other way, of course. Uh, and uh, if you're curious about machine translation, you know, it takes a few hours to run that, and, <coughs> and you can experiment, okay? And this is based on LSTM. And then the weirder kids in the, in the classroom are called GANs, uh, Generative Adversarial Network. So the previous ones, the deep neural networks and the, C and the uh, convolutional neural networks and the LSTM, et cetera, we, we mostly use them to predict the existing world. We want them to understand existing images. We want them to understand text, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, now what about generating stuff, right? So believe it or not, these faces do not exist. They have been generated by a neural network. Okay, there's a data set called the celebrity data set that is used by GANs. Okay, and this is a, a cool project by uh, NVIDIA actually. Uh, it is on GitHub again. Uh, and those networks learn how to build new faces. So it's not copying existing faces, it's just learning how to build samples that are inspired, 
quote unquote, from the existing data sets. So it's not about replicating. None of these faces exist in the data set. It's about inventing, generating samples based on similar data uh, in the data set. Okay? So here's another example, different project. So this one here starts from, it doesn't even start from real life pictures. It starts from semantic maps, which you see in the lower left corner. A semantic map is what a five-year-old kid would draw, right? If you, if you told uh, that kid, hey, uh, just outline you know, the road and the trees and the car and put some colors and zero detail at all, right? Uh, I could do this with paintbrush, just, you know. And, and, and using a data set with similar images, I would be able to generate something like this, which is high res, super detailed. You can go to the page and zoom in on that picture and see it's really pixel perfect. Right? So these GANs, they can also be used for they have industrial applications. Actually, at reInvent, the last reInvent, we had Autodesk on stage explaining how they use similar techniques to generate mechanical parts. Right? So instead of a human drawing the part, they just give constraints. Right? They say, OK, here are the, the overall dimensions, the weight, uh, the mechanical strength, blah, blah, blah. Right? They give some parameters, and then Deep, a deep learning algo invents, literally, a mechanical part that fulfills all those requirements. Right? You can see that video uh, on YouTube. It's, it's pretty fascinating. They show some examples with a, um, you know, a motorbike parts, so the swing arm for a motorbike, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the, the networks come up with very, very interesting shapes. And actually, they look very cool, too. So now, how do you build that stuff? Well, you could pick a, a number of libraries. Um, AWS tends to like MXNet um, for a number of reasons. First, it has uh, probably the best language support out there, which means that even though Python is, is probably the language of choice, you can use other languages on MXNet. You could use C++, you can use uh, Scala, uh, Julia, uh, and, and a few more, right? So better choice, better language choice for developers. Um, it's portable, so it, it, it's going to run fine on powerful systems, you know, CPU, GPU instances, etc. But as it turns out, it runs very well in the embedded space as well. Um, I, I use it frequently on you know, Raspberry Pis, and it works pretty well. Of course, you don't have the same performance as a C5, right? But you, you're still <laughs> able to do local prediction, local image classification on a Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi is just one gig of memory, and it's a not very, it, it doesn't have a very powerful CPU. Right? So you can still get job done, the job done at the edge with MXNet. That's not the case for other libraries. Now, when it comes to training, uh, if you have large data set, right, if you're at the other end of the spectrum, and you have millions of images and hours of uh, speech, you know, days or weeks of speech to train on, uh, if you train on one single instance, you know, it, could take, it could take days, right? So that's a problem because you want to be able to iterate fast. You want to be able to try different parameters. So training time does matter. It's not just cost. It's about agility, too. So the faster you can train, the better the model will be at the end, okay? the more combinations you can try. So that means so the ability to scale linearly, the ability to add GPUs and cut training times linearly is great. So if that, early, if that initial job takes, let's say, 16 days, right? Um, if you throw 16 GPUs at it, uh, it's going to take one day, give or take, right? So, and it scales up to 256 GPUs, OK? That's a big training job, right? Really big. But we have, we have pretty extreme customers sometimes, right? And well, the last good thing, and I think this is great news for everybody, is that this project has been accepted into uh, the Apache incubator. So it's now ac actually called Apache MXNet, <clears throat> which is the best guarantee that it's not owned by anyone, right? Um, again, probably not the case for other libraries. And you know, some companies have a history of opening stuff and closing stuff. Uh, I don't like it. I don't think any developer should like it. And uh, I think one of the reasons why the Apache project is so cool is that once a project is part of that, no one owns it, no one controls it, no one can close it and lock you in into their uh, proprietary software. Okay. So we like it. We use it internally to build our own services. 
uh, and I'm going to show you how you can use it yourself. So what will you find in there? So if you're not familiar at all with any of those libraries, you know, MXNet, TensorFlow, Keras, Cafe, et cetera, uh, what you'll find in there are actually building blocks again, right? Lego blocks um, that let you build all those kinds of network architectures. So you can build uh, fully connected networks, so the typical deep neural network. You can build convolutional networks, you can build LSTM, et cetera, et cetera. So you'll find high-level objects that you can combine to build all those network architectures. So that's the good thing. You don't have to go very deep and define each neuron individually and connect it to the next neurons, et cetera. You can just, in a few lines, create layers and combine them. Okay? And that's how you get to those 50 lines of Python. I know I'm teasing you with the 50 lines of Python, but you will get to see the 50 lines of Python, and it is really 50 lines of Python. And the reason why it's only 50 is because we have those high-level APIs, right? Uh, you can do some additional cool stuff with MXNet, uh, like serving models. Okay, it's good to train, right? But at, at, at some point, you know, you want to predict, uh, and it's quite likely you want to predict using <coughs> HTTP requests, right? So sure, you could build your own web app and embed the model, and okay, fine. Or you could use the model server, which has a built-in Nginx uh, web server, and just point the model server to the model you just trained, launch that. Five seconds later, you can run HTTP calls and run some predictions. Okay? Uh, so I haven't tried it in production. You know, I don't know how. I can't make any recommendations right now. But at least for development and testing, this is great. Right? Great time saver. Another Productivity feature is uh, support for ONNX, which is basically interoperability between different frameworks. So you could take an MXNet model, a CAFE model, and, and load them as is in other libraries, right? So that's pretty cool, because now you can grab CAFE, let's say, CAFE models on GitHub and load them directly in MXNet and use them. You don't have to rewrite them and retrain them, okay? And as of uh, one day ago, two days ago, this is also supported by the model server. So you can now actually download the cafe model, load it in the model server, and serve predictions. Right? So pretty nice and nice time saver for everybody. So what are the objects we need to uh, know? What are the basics we need to know to look at the, some code? So deep learning is always about data. So the first step is having an object where you can load the data set, access it, transfer transform it, okay? And this object in MXNet is called ND array, which stands for n-dimensional array, right? So it's, like, it's a tensor, but I think that name was already taken, right? Yeah, okay. Even though it's not a copyright, right? Okay, so the ND array is just a multi-dimensional array where you can load your, your data and feed it to models, okay? Now we need to build the models. So using the, the building blocks that I showed you, right, the um, uh, different uh, APIs, uh, we can combine them and build the layers in just a few lines of code. Now we need also an object that's going to serve the data to the model. And if you're <laughs> familiar with machine learning, you know usually we don't take the full data set and push it in one go, right? We slice it into batches and we feed the, the data set to the model batch by batch, and each time the model gets an opportunity to learn, adjust weights using back propagation. Okay, so it would be a shame if we had to do that manually, right? Slice and, and dice. And so here, thanks to iterators, we just give the data set to the iterator uh, and say, okay, you need to serve this 32 samples at a time, just do it, right? And again, that takes a lot of. Uh, problems away from us. And finally, uh, we need an API to train and save models, okay? And this is gonna be called the module API, okay? So if you start learning about MXNet, make sure you understand those four, uh, those four APIs. They're really enough to get started. Okay, so now let's look at some actual code. Um, so we're gonna do a hello world first, right? Because I suspect a lot of you uh, have very little uh, deep learning experience, so it's always good to start with deep learning. Uh, and, and a simple example. Um, then we're going to use pre-trained models, right? 
and see what we can do with this, what's the benefit. And then we're going to train a model from scratch on a simple data set and try to learn some more stuff as well. So you'll find all this plus more in GitHub uh, on, at, this, uh, at this URL. Okay. All right. Can you read it in the back, or is it, yeah, is that okay? Okay. If it gets too small, just, okay, wave, right? Okay, so here's the Hello World um, example. So what we're going to do here is we're going to create a data set from scratch, okay? A, a synthetic data set, completely random. Sounds like a weird ID, but you'll see why I want to do this, okay? So I'm going to create 10,000 samples. Okay, I'm going to use 8,000 for training, 2,000 for validation. And each sample is actually, it's a vector of 100 random float values between 0 and 1. Okay? So my data set is really a matrix, right? 10,000 lines, one line per sample, 100 columns, right? 100 features per sample. Okay? So that's, those are my samples. And my labels, okay? The labels that need to be learned by the network are uh, random integers between 0 and 9. Okay? So it's a classification problem. I have 10,000 samples, each with a label between 0 and 9, and my network should learn how to properly classify that. Okay? This is as simple as it gets. All right, so let's run those cells. Okay. Let's create the data set. Okay, I'm using just, uh, again, random data here, right? Random data for the samples, random data for the categories. Then I'm splitting those into training and validation, right? So as you can see, I have an 8,000 by 100 matrix for training with 8,000 labels and a 2,000 by 100 matrix for uh, validation with 2,000 labels, all right? Okay, done. <laughs> Not too much data prep here. Now, let's define a network. So here, I'm using the symbolic API in MXNet. I'll show you in the SageMaker demo uh, a higher level API in MXNet called Gluon, which you may have heard about, which has a different way of, of uh, defining networks. But here's the symbolic way. So as you can see here, I just define an input layer. It's called data. I don't have to give it shape at the moment. And then I have one fully connected layer with 10, 24 neurons, okay? Fully connected means all neurons are connected to, each neuron in that layer is connected to all neurons in the previous layer and all neurons in the next layer, okay? So it's, it's a mesh, it's a fully meshed network, okay? Um, I'm using the ReLU activation function, let's ignore that for the moment. Then I have a second, uh, out, a second fully connected layer with 10 uh, neurons, right? And why 10? Because these are the categories I want to predict, okay? So in each, and that's the output layer. So in each of those neurons, actually, I will have the probability that the, the, a given sample belongs to this category, right? So ideally, on the, when I predict, I would have, uh, on those 10 output neurons, I would have nine zeros and one one, right? Which would mean 100% probability. In practice, you never get to round numbers like that but the highest probability there will tell me what category this belongs to, okay? All right, so that's just a few lines, just a few lines of code. <coughs> I build my iterator, okay? So basically saying I want to serve this training set uh, with this batch size here, right? Okay, we're going to ignore this. And they, then I need to bind, maybe I should, yeah, unzoom a bit. Uh, we need to bind the data to the model, saying, okay, this is the data set I'm going to apply to this model. I need to initialize some parameters, but you could do without that and use default values. And then I'm training, and I'm going to train for 50 epochs. Let's run it. One epoch is pushing the data set through the network once, batch by batch. Okay, so I'm doing this 50 times. It's an iterative process because the network needs, needs enough epochs to learn. Okay? And as we go through the epochs, we see the training accuracy, which is how well 
the network currently predicts the training set. So it starts at 9% and goes up and up and up. 95, 96, 98, 99, and we get to actually 100%, right? So first time you do this, you get all excited. Like, yeah, I built a working neural network. Awesome. Wait for it, right? <laughs> it's OK to get excited. but And it stays at 1 because you can't go any higher, right? So well, perfect. OK, so that was super fast, and I get 100% accuracy. Life is good, OK? But hey, what about real life samples, OK? I, I kept 20% of my samples on the side, right? The network has not seen them before. And maybe I should measure the accuracy with those. What do you think? Any guess? Do we get 100%? <laughs> we get 10%. And that's not, a, that's not a coincidence, right? We have 10 categories. It's random data. So we're predicting like this, right? So every once in a while, once every 10 shots in average, on average, we get it right. Okay? So two lessons here. Garbage in, garbage out. If there are no patterns in your data, don't trust that a neural network is going to find them. Right? There's nothing to be learned in that data. It's random. Okay? Second thing. Training accuracy will get to one eventually if you train long enough, always. That's one of the only things. You know, death, taxes, and training accuracy getting to one, <laughs> right? Right? Yeah. Can't do anything for the first two, but I can help you with the third. So tr validation accuracy is the one you need to worry about, OK? So this is not working at all, OK? Pretty cool example, right? <laughs> all right. OK, so training is complicated. So let's move on. Let's say, oh, no, I don't want to train. Uh, let's do it like the, uh, maybe the Expedia guys did it. Let's take a pre-trained network and sounds like a safer bet. OK, so here we're going to grab three models, three image classification models uh, from the MXNet model zoo. Right? That's a cool name. Uh, those libraries, they have model zoos, collections of pre-trained networks on large data sets. OK, so I downloaded them for in the interest of time already. And uh, when you download them, you actually download the network definition. So you get a JSON file that defines all the layers. But you don't need to read that stuff. Just know that it's there. And you get a parameter file that stores the actual weights right, that have been learned during training. And I also need a file with the category names. These data sets have been trained on a data set called ImageNet, which is a, a very large image data set with 1,000 categories. OK, so in that synset.txt file, I've got the category in numbers and the descriptions. I'm going to need them later on to, uh, to display results, OK? All right. So let's load this. Let's import MXNet. How do you load a model? Well, basically, it's one line of code. The rest is just boilerplate. Um, you just load. It's, it's called load checkpoint. And you pass the name of the file that you downloaded, OK? So that creates. Uh, a symbol, a symbolic network that you can use. Okay? So you don't need to define it like we did earlier. You can just load it. Okay? I need to decide whether I want to use it on GPU and CPU. And you can see how easy it is. It's just one parameter. By default, you run on CPU. If you want to run on GPU, just set that context parameter. If I want to use multiple GPUs, I would just have a list of GPUs in here. Okay? Then I need to bind it. So binding it really means defining the shape of the input layer. Okay, so this pre-trained network has been trained for color images that are 20, 224 by 224 pixels. So the input shape will be one image, three channels, red, green, and blue, and 224 by 224. So my input shape is really it's a four-dimension tensor. Okay. Fine, I define this. I need to load my categories in memory. That's just Python. Let's ignore that. I need to load an image from disk into an ND array, right? So my JPEG file needs to become that uh, 3 by 224 by 224 tensor, right? So I need to make sure red, green, and blue are, are in the right order. For whatever reason, OpenCV, which I'm using here, uh, loads images with blue, green, and red. Was the designer British, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> Just a guess. 
just a guess. Right? Uh, loading in the wrong order. All right. Anyway, more power to them. It's a fantastic library. Uh, I need to resize it to 224, 224, and I'm returning this ND array. Okay? So that's just data loading here. Nothing, nothing bad. And predicting really means loading the image into an array and calling that forward API, which really pushes that sample into the network. Getting the outputs, so getting the 1,000 probabilities, remember? One probability per output neuron. Uh, sorting them and f returning the top five. Okay? And if you're not familiar with Python uh, weirdness, don't worry about this. This is really the only thing I'm doing here. Sorting the array, taking the top five. Right? Okay, let's run this stuff. Okay, so uh, now it's time to load my models. Okay, so I'm loading all three models here. Okay, using the functions I just showed you. Uh, and let's try to predict this image. All right? Okay, here we go. All right, so here I'm running on CPU, right? So my first model says 96.9% it's a violin. Um, the second model, and all, all three are convolutional neural networks, gives pr almost the same result, funny. And the third one has just a lower probability. But as you can see, it's quite faster too, right? Because it's, it's just more clever. It is very deep, but it's, it's clever. That's the only way I can put it simply. So as you can see, um, there are pretty wild differences, not necessarily in prediction, uh, but in performance, OK? All right, so that worked, right? Now, let's try again on the <coughs> GPU. So I'm just loading the networks again, but this time for the GPU. Oh, what's going on here? Out of memory. Oh, well, that's interesting. Uh, OK, <coughs> fair enough. OK, let me fix this. Too much stuff running in there, probably. Oh, yeah, that's the one I want. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> all right, yeah, that's a lot of stuff running. So, yeah, it's just, yeah, okay, all right. Uh, yeah, let's just. Close everything here. Thank you. And that should now work, right? Hopefully. OK, let's restart everything. Come on. Yes. All right, so I need just to do this quickly. OK, so CPU prediction. And we should see, yes. Sorry about that. And I see the same predictions, right? The results are the same, right? But as you can see, the performance is much better. Okay, so yes, you get better performance for uh, f with GPUs. But does it really matter that you predict in 0.05 microsecond versus 0.1 microsecond? Right? Maybe that's good enough for your app on CPU. And as you can see, the cost, as we saw earlier, the cost is much better. Okay. So bottom line, we don't ca get to count the Python lines here, but trust me, it's 60 lines with a lot of comments. So it's not a lot of code. So now let's learn from scratch, OK? That's the last thing I want to do. I've got five minutes left. Should be enough. So remember that LeNet convolutional neural network that we saw? Well, we're going to design that one and train it, OK? So uh, and let me run everything now while I explain it. So first thing is I need to download the data set, <coughs> hopefully. and. Uh, Please download the data set. All right, or not. 
Yeah, sometimes Jupiter gets a little annoying here. Here we go. OK, so I'm, down I'm downloading the MNIST data set. This data set uh, is built from uh, 60,000 handwritten digits, OK, uh, which are 0 to 9. OK, so the name of the game will be to classify those images uh, in the right category, obviously. OK, so let's run all below. Come on. Interesting. Okay, so looks like Jupiter is playing tricks on me now. Yeah, okay, sorry about that. Uh, now it's time to run this thing. Okay, so. We downloaded the data set. It's already split between training and validation, OK? So here, I'm going to train for 25 epochs, all right? I use iterators for the training and the validation data set. The cool thing is we already have pre-built iterators for MNIST, so we can even save on the parameters. And this is the network definition, again, using the symbolic API, right? And it's pretty much the one you saw in the picture with the 60 uh, kilometer per hour sign, right, with just a few tweaks. But that's all it takes. And as you can see, we have high-level symbols for convolution, activation, pooling, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, we just need to give the right sizes, and we don't have to fully understand how those objects work. We can dive deeper later, but for the moment, we could literally look at, at the network on paper and, and code it with the symbolic API. OK? I'm going to run this on the GPU. And I'm binding the model to the data set and the iterators that I downloaded. And then I'm training for 25 epochs, OK? All right, so I can see those epochs going by, fine. And now we need to be careful, right? And uh, look at both training accuracy and validation accuracy. So training accuracy goes up. We do get to 1, right, eventually. And validation accuracy, which is the one that we really care about, is 99.2 almost, right? So looks more promising than the previous examples, yes? I can save the model, OK, using this simple API. And now I want to predict with it, OK? So as you can see, training here is really these 20 lines of code, right? It's super easy, right? Those high-level APIs, they're super easy. So the last thing I want to show you, let me just reload this, is how you can predict now with this, OK? Uh, with my violin example, uh, I took a model from the model zoo, loaded it, et cetera. Here, it's one of mine, OK? But it is pretty much the same process. So let's reset the notebook to make sure we don't have any more surprises, OK? Uh, I need to define the image again, OK? The difference here is. It's, uh, these are black and white images, right, that I'm going to load. So uh, grayscale will work just fine. Predicting is pretty much the exact same code as you saw before, right? Loading into an NDRA, predicting. Loading a model is the exact same code you saw before. And now I'm going to load my pre-trained model. And I'm going to predict some digits, right? And these are real-life samples that I drew myself. I wanted, to, I wanted them to be ugly because real life samples are never good looking, right? Training sets, they all, they're always so nice. Validation sets, they're too easy usually. So you need ugly real life samples to really understand how well your model does, right? So these are paintbrush, you know, proudly built with paintbrush uh, and, and a mouse, right? So predicting those digits, I get 10 probabilities on the output layer. Right? And I, I limited myself to four decimals. So it's rounded up to one, but it's actually 0, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9 something. Okay? So yeah, this is really a zero, right? We're confident. This is really a one. Two is good. Three is very good. Four is very good. Five. Six. Seven is good. Eight, no problem. And nine is totally wrong. Yes, <laughs> right? 
Yeah. OK? Because it's ugly. And do we have any Americans in the room? Oh, that's a sh Yeah? OK. Uh, you have to explain to me how you draw those nines in America. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it's a specific process, believe me, because I, I, I could never draw a nine successfully. This, the MNIST data set is an American data set, and I can never get the nine correct. So you know, in France, we do it with a very round end like this. It never works. And so I tried a straight end like this. It doesn't work either. So here's the test for, you know, uh, for the uh, Homeland Security uh, teams, <laughs> right? If you want to prove that you're an American citizen, draw a nine, right? <laughs> they would catch me every time. So that doesn't really work, OK? So again, from one training to the next, it might work. It depends. It depends on you know, the initial. Uh, the initialization of the model. Sometimes I, it, they do understand my uh, ugly nines. Sometimes they don't. It goes to show that you should never train only one model. You should train many models, score them for validation, and score them on real life samples, and pick the one that works best. Okay. So this shows that uh, automating uh, training is a really important process, and uh, this is why SageMaker is going to help. Right to. Uh, uh, to tie in into the, the further session. All right, just before I uh, let Jan tell you all about chatbots, fascinating subjects, I want to share a few more resources. Uh, you will get the slides, right? My, uh, my colleagues will see to that. Um, so some uh, resources on the AWS website, all the MXNet links, um, including the GitHub uh, code and the Gluon API, which I'll talk about in the SageMaker session. And uh, I'm actively blogging as well on Medium. Uh, and uh, you'll find a, a, a good bunch of articles over there. And I want to point out a single article that is still fairly recent. Um, it's in two parts. I call it 10 Steps on the Road to Deep Learning. And it's basically, I'm, I'm telling you how I did it, not to show off. That's not the point. I'm just showing you what resources I used and in what order to learn this stuff, right? And I started from scratch. You know, I, I know a tiny bit about this stuff now. And uh, if I did it, you can do it. And these are all the resources and the links and the order in which I did it. So hopefully, this can help you as well, OK? All right, I'm done. I can take a break. But you, you don't take a break, right? Because Ian is gone. We have a break? All right. Oh, OK. We're friendlier than in the, in the Nordics, right? They had no breaks in the Nordics. Uh, so you have a break. Get more coffee. Chatbot session afterwards. I'm going to take a nap, check my demos, and I'll see you after lunch for more sessions, all right? Thank you very much. Thank you.